The painting that serves as my title image for today's talk uh, depicts a young woman against the backdrop of a blue sky, clasping her white shift and wore a rose colored shawl to cover herself as she gazes calm and expressionless at the viewer. Who is this woman? Why is she outdoors wearing only an undergarment and shawl? Is she dressing or undressing? Why is it titled Italian woman? Is she really Italian? More broadly, what kind of painting is this? Is it a portrait or a genre scene? Paintings of this kind depicting attractive young women but categorized neither as portraits nor narrative genre scenes became extremely common in mid 19th century Russia. And while I don't think we'll be able to find out exactly who this woman is or what she's doing, I plan to use this painting and others like it um, as a lens through which to explore the art world of this period. While conducting research for my current book project on the female nude in Russian art in the 18th and 19th centuries, these paintings have come up repeatedly. Today, I'd like to consider their production as a phenomenon of the art market in Russia from about 1830 to, to, um, through 1860. I plan to argue that these paintings signal an early moment of market expansion in the Russian art world, an expansion that's typically placed in the 1860s and 70s with the advent of Russian, of, of artists exhibiting organizations, namely the Pedidvizhniki. My motivation for examining the Russian art market stems from studying the development of art, the art market in the Netherlands in the late 16th and especially the 17th centuries. These two paintings that we're looking at give us a sense of art collecting in the late 17th century when paintings were affordable and abundant, even in homes that were more modest than these. Since the 1980s, scholarship on Dutch art has drawn on extensive and detailed inventories of household property, including art, made for estate purposes, auctions, and bankruptcy filings. This work, pioneered by Yale economist John Michael Montius and pursued by art historians, has led many studies of Dutch and Flemish art to consider, if not focus entirely, on the kinds of economic issues that naturally affect painting, as well as other luxury and semi-luxury goods, all based on hard data compiled into databases that enable statistical analysis. Work on art markets in other regions of Europe in different periods has also flourished, especially 15th to 17th century Italy, 18th and 19th century France and Britain, um, relying on family archives, auction and sale records, and dealer account books. In Russia, no inventories comparable to the Dutch sources exist. Uh, most information on collections and estate sales comes from elite collectors rather than ordinary people who might own just a few paintings. Even images like this uh, probably represent artists' homes. So I don't think that they're representative of, of the typical um, middling home of a person who might collect a few pieces of art. Much of my research comes from primary sources, exhibition catalogs from the Imperial Academy of Arts, the few extant sale catalogs from the period, inventories or catalog raisonne of artists' work, and general descriptions of picture shops and booths, lavki, at city markets. All this to say that records about the art market in St. Petersburg remain partial, fragmentary, and sometimes non-existent. I've not yet found any secondary literature devoted to the kinds of paintings that I'll be discussing to, um, today. Still, I believe that some of the findings that scholars have made about art markets in other countries, especially in periods when art acquisition spread beyond the elite to the lower nobility and middling classes, for example, 18th and 19th century Britain, France, and the United States. I believe that some of these observations about art market forces um, can be brought to bear on Russia in the middle decades of the, of the 19th century. We should do this very cautiously, only when the findings can be supported by evidence from the incomplete sources that I just mentioned, as well as by anecdotal evidence from contemporary literature and criticism. So today we'll focus on paintings of this type to see what they tell us about the art market in mid 19th century Russia. First, I'll look at a history of these types of depictions. Then we'll, we'll examine two case studies of artists who navigated the new art market. And finally, we'll consider how the issues raised here are reflected in Russian literary fiction of this period. In doing so, I hope to draw some conclusions about what this means in the Russian art world. Because this is part of a chapter that I'm currently writing, I'd be grateful for any feedback on these ideas. Tiranov's Italian woman falls into a loose category of paintings 
known in Russian as the Golovka, plural is Golovki, which is the diminutive for head. <clears throat> a Golovka is a bust length portrait, sometimes half length, sometimes just a head, usually made from a live model, but not intended to represent a specific individual. In English, this kind of painting is called an ideal head, sometimes a character head or portrait type, or just a head. And I'm using all of these terms interchangeably, in including Golovka and Golovki throughout this talk. Golovki have their origins in the Netherland Netherlandish pony paintings that Flemish artists started making in the 16th century, and Rembrandt and other artists produced in abundance during the 17th. Artists painted both male and female ponies to show their skill in rendering fine fabrics, exotic accessories, and expressive faces or distinctive character types. They might capture a man in shining decorated armor and a feathered beret, or a beautiful woman with a pearl earring. The loose jacket she wears, the unusual turban, and the oversized earrings would have marked her as an exotic beauty. In contrast with portraits, which were usually done on commission, tonies or ideal heads were almost always done on speculation. Artists painted them to attract clients and sustain themselves in between commissions. In the 18th century, ideal heads became fashionable across Europe and they increasingly portrayed young women. Rotari was an Italian artist who painted portraits and devotional works for royal courts in Central Europe before arriving in St. Petersburg in 1756. His Golovki featured young women in fashionable or ethnic dress whose faces displayed various moods or expressions. The best known collection of Rotari's work hangs in the Grand Palace at Peterhof, which Catherine the Great filled with 328 of his character heads. By the later 18th century, Jean-Baptiste Greuze further popularized these images, which ranged, as we see here, from rather chaste to quite suggestive. Most of his paintings depicted young girls, but he occasionally painted boys as well, often dressed as shepherds. Some scholars exclude from this category heads depicted with symbols, suggesting allegorical or mythological meaning, or figures that seem to be doing something which can be considered genre painting. So for this brief history so far, I've only shown heads, Golovki strictly defined, not girls with birds, with dogs doing needlework or with their hands clasped in prayer. Although I think that many times these are just a kind of a pretext for a Golovka or a head, um, a beautiful person. Um, but for the purposes of my study, which focuses on the art market, instead of policing boundaries and definitions, I am being, as we'll see, fairly inclusive about this category, and I'm not concerned with overlap into other genres. In fact, I'm quite interested in overlap between Golovki and other images of women. In Russia, painters such as Vasily Trapinin and Alexey Venetsyanov, among others, produced Golovki as a natural intersection of their specialties, genre painting and portraiture. What changed with the next generation of artists, as we'll see, were two related developments, what we might call product innovation and process innovation. And here are, I'm borrowing those terms from the Dutch economic studies. A key figure in these developments in Russia was Karl Brulov. In addition to the large scale history paintings and church decorations that represent his most prestigious works, he painted numerous portraits, genre scenes, and single, single figure paintings, such as Italian Morning and Italian Midday, which we see here. Um, he painted these after arriving in Rome in 1822. Technically, these can be considered genre scenes because the women are doing something, but like Golovki, they, fo they focus on a single figure in a simple setting, rather than participating in a complex multi-figure scene depicting Italian customs. Italian Morning was the first painting Brulov sent back to his sponsoring organization in St. Petersburg, the Society for the Encouragement of Artists, which presented it to Nicholas I. The Tsar was so pleased that he commissioned a pendant, which became Italian Midday. Brulov made these two as a sideline to his main project, at this time, he was supposed to be copying Raphael's School of Athens, which was a huge project. But since the Vatican was open to copyists only a few afternoons a week, he filled the rest of his time with less demanding work. Even after he'd finished the School of Athens and was well into his major painting, The Last Day of Pompeii, 
Roloff made this variant of his this variant of his Italian midday, which was less than half as large. What was his motivation? Well, it could have been a commission from someone who wanted the same painting as the Tsar, or perhaps he made it for the market. In any case, it's clear that an artist of Ruloff's talent and ambition was not repeating a painting he'd made four years earlier as an artistic challenge for himself. By this time, he had turned down the stipend that he'd been receiving from the Society for the Encouragement of the Artists. Um, he was tired of their oversight and their demands that he um, keep reporting to them and doing the kind of work that they wanted him to do. So he was no longer receiving their stipend and he was living solely on commissions. For this reason, it would not be a stretch to suggest that he did this to help support himself. After Bruloff returned to St. Petersburg in 1836, he was named professor of history painting and portraiture at the academy. Students clamored to work with him. He undertook major commissions for religious and historical subjects, but in the winter months, he worked on smaller projects that were easier to finish when daylight was scarce. Bruloff's pupils, whether they started out as history painters or portraitists, eventually followed their teacher in producing portraits on commission and small scale ideal heads on speculation for the market. Ruloff encouraged students to copy his work, including portraits of notable cultural figures and these kinds of depictions of women. These two paintings today located in Krasnodar and Voronezh are by copyists whose names were not recorded. We cannot say for certain that they were by Bruloff's students or followers, but they do testify to a demand for Bruloff's work of this type. So one of those students was Ivan Kapkov, who painted this young widow, Vdovushka, in 1831. <clears throat> Kapkov had been born into serfdom, then liberated at age 16, about a year after painting this. He first studied with Alexei Yegorov, then with Bruloff by the late 1830s as an external student at the academy. By the late 1830s, Kapkov was on track to become a history painter, working on mythological and biblical subjects, as we see here. This depicts the pool of Siloam, where Jesus had sent the man born blind to be healed. All the students competing for the academy's gold medal were assigned the same topic each year. They were given brief a brief description that sometimes included how many paintings should, uh, sorry, how many figures needed to be included in the painting. Here, Kapkov ticks all the academic boxes. He renders the figures in a believable three-dimensional space. He demonstrates his knowledge of anatomy with a number of semi-nude figures, and even quotes canonical works like Raphael's Transfiguration at the top, Tintoretto's St. Mark with his group of figures, uh, perhaps Poussin's Plague, and the Hellenistic sculpture of the Dying Gaul at the bottom. So the classicizing architecture, a nice believable um, depiction of water, um, all of this was icing on the cake. So the painting won him a gold medal that allowed him to travel to Italy, where he would have finished his training and launched his career. <clears throat> but he had to return home early due to the revolutionary events of 1848. After his return to Russia in 1849, we don't see any more history paintings by Kapkov. He became known as a copyist after Bruloff. He was probably one of the anonymous copyists whose work shows up today in regional museums. I'm introducing Kapkov today to help, to help us think about the issue of competition among artists who operated just below the top tier history painters. Beyond the state and the church, there was simply no demand for complex, large-scale paintings like the Pool of Siloam. The new art collectors who were starting to buy pictures in St. Petersburg and Moscow in the mid-19th century were members of the middling classes who wanted paintings that they could afford and understand, small-scale pictures on familiar themes. So after returning to Russia in 1849, Kapkov started making variants of his own work essentially upgrading the young widow he'd painted almost two decades earlier. In the new version, we can see on the right, her head is slightly turned, so she's a little bit facing towards us a bit more. Um, and this, he, in this, he's using the technique of foreshortening. 
her veil becomes transparent so that we can see it's edged by lace. We can just see that on the top of her head. And we can also see that he's revealing her dark braid underneath. And remember, of course, using black on black and different shades of black to achieve transparency. All of this is um, very subtle work on the part of the painter. The face becomes slightly more individualized, less generic, more expressive. Still, it's a very simple image painted in a limited palette with a simple green background, something he could have painted fairly quickly. We can see this as a kind of product innovation. If you liked the earlier Young Widow, this is a new and improved version. Kapkoff went on to paint more repetitions of the 1831 image and new variants of the theme. He painted other Golovki, a bather, a praying woman, a Turkish woman in a turban, but he became known for the widows. In other words, he established a subspecialty or a niche market of Golovka paintings, a beautiful young woman shedding tears of grief. Kapkov's motif was so popular that it became a source of competition. <clears throat> For example, Fyodor Moller's Bride, painted 10 years after the original Young Widow. It depicts a similarly pensive woman, but possibly a less gloomy theme, a young bride contemplating her ring. Moller's Bride would have, would have been seen as a more sophisticated painting than Kapkoff's very restrained depiction. Um, from her uh, simple dress, um, her hairstyle with the headband, this sort of Grecian brow line. It's this a, a bit ambiguous um, whether she's a woman from the classical past or perhaps a modern woman in her underclothes. She's shown in an elegant room with a suggestion of a setting, unlike Kapkoff's, and more of her body is shown. So um, we can see that uh, he uses lines in a very careful way. If you follow my cursor, you can see that we, we, if we start at her hands, right, a line we can trace up along her arm and her shawl, along the back of her neck, forward to her uh, headband, and then down following her gaze back to her hand. So it creates this nice oval, this continuous oval shape. Um, and this is really a typical academic gesture that artists learned about composition. It was just something that part of uh, an essential part of their training. It creates a sense of intimacy and focus that lends a gracefulness to her pensive mood. And the mirror in the background echoes that curve, that roundness uh, to produce a kind of harmony. It also, you'll notice if you look in the mirror, it reflects something of the room to heighten the effect of a three dimensional space. But in its essence, this painting is nothing new. It's a new and improved version of Kapkoff's Widow, which I flipped 180 degrees here to make my point. Muller's Bride became extremely popular in, in the mid-19th century and was a great favorite for copies and reproductions. Incidentally, Muller was one of those history painters getting state commissions, most notably for six monumental canvases in the Alexander Hall of the Great, um, of the Great Kremlin Palace. So he was considered a notch above Kapkov. Uh, and as a nobleman, he would not have had such immediate economic concerns as a former serf. Not to be outdone though, Kapkov painted his own contemplative bride, uh, flipped 180 degrees back to the orientation of his widows, this one in an Italian style dress that added a certain foreign cachet, uh, also lace, abundant lace. Um, and it would signal to his viewers that that it was made by an artist who traveled abroad. Kapkov's variants of his own work, as well as what I perceive to be his, his interchange with Moller, borrowing and adapting or improving on a motif, these can all be seen as examples of product differentiation. These are strategies that allow artists to, to survive in a competitive environment. So while the art market in Russia is still fairly small, still largely limited to St. Petersburg and to some extent Moscow, I would argue that these strategies signal an expansion of the art market precisely during this period. It also shows that the market for Golovki focuses on female imagery. We do not have comparable paintings of young bridegrooms or widowers. Now, when we look at Pavel Fyodotov's series of widows, which are very well known in the Russian canon, while these are usually discussed in terms of Fyodotov's biography, we understand that he was not working in splendid isolation. The beautiful downcast young woman depicted in profile had become a kind of stock image that Fyodotov developed into a full-blown genre scene in his own style. 
So now for my second case study, I'd like to properly introduce Alexei Tiranov, um, whose early work uh, we see here. Tiranov was only a few years older than Kapkov and had studied with Alexei Venetsyanov. Venetsyanov had brought Tiranov from his provincial school to St. Petersburg in the late 1820s around the time the painting at the left, uh, well, just before the painting in the left was made. Um, the young artist quickly attracted the attention of the Tsar with his perspectival interior of the Hermitage Library. He also proved to, to be an accomplished portraitist, as we see at the right. Then when Brulov arrived in St. Petersburg in 1836, Tiranov was the first artist to begin working with him. He is often called a pupil of Brulov, but since he was almost 30 years old and was not enrolled at the academy, I consider him to be a follower rather than a student. According to writers of the period, he was the only one of Brulov's pupils or followers who had truly mastered Brulov's style. Once he started working with Brulov, Tiranov started producing images like this. Since she's fixing her hair, you could say that this is a genre scene, but what matters to us is that there's no narrative or historical pretext for this subject. It isn't part of the so-called Italian genre that supposedly tells us something about a foreign culture, nor is it a Venus or bathing nymph, which would be Greco-Roman subject matter, which is supposedly historical and therefore supposedly elevated. She's just a contemporary woman arranging her hair in a, hair, hair in a hairstyle from about 1840. She's not even expressing an emotion like Kapkov's, which would have suggested womanly virtues, fidelity or devotion. In other words, the sole purpose of this painting is to be a depiction of female beauty. It was quite common for ambitious artists to paint a nude or semi-nude woman, sometimes just one, as Kapkov did, as a way of showing their skill, comparing themselves to great artists of the past, like Titian or Rubens, whose work they were allowed to see at the Hermitage. But what was new around 1840 was, what they, was that they started to produce repetitions of their own work, not just variants and improvements as with Kapkov, but exact repetitions. And these repetitions also tell us something about the art market, most obviously that there is a demand for these works and that Tiranov, like Kapkov, was developing his own niche market. Tiranov's choice to copy his own work rather than paint a new or even slightly different version of the same thing can be interpreted in a couple of different ways. One, it could be that he was choosing to save time. In economic terms, minimizing his production costs to, to, max, to, to increase profits, which I realize ho sounds horribly crass, but to put it another way, he could paint these quickly to put bread on the table while spending more time on prestigious portrait commissions. Or two, it could be that he knew St. Petersburg collections preferred to buy a painting just like one they had seen before. Inexperienced collectors values, value copies because they are already sanctioned by people who know art. This would not be surprising for members of the middling classes who were just starting to buy art at this time and might not have the confidence to splash out on totally unfamiliar images. So here I'm deliberately showing a blurred image to stand in for a painting that likely no longer exists. What really surprised me was finding that a student of Brulov, Konstantin Grigorovich, whose work we do not see here, um, copied Tiranov's painting and showed it at the Academy of Arts exhibition in 1846 when he was about 23 years old. The painter was the son of the Academy's conference secretary, Vasily Grigorovich, so he was really um, well connected in the art world, in the art establishment. Uh, Brulov's painting, or sorry, Brulov's uh, allowing his student to exhibit a copy after his follower Tiranov's semi nude figure shows that works in this vein were very much part of the master's legacy, kind of all in the family. So unlike Kapkov's variants and innovations, here we have another artist creating a niche market, this time for a specific image, and as we'll see, a formula for beauty. The usual explanation behind paintings like this um, go, goes something as follows. The high-spirited, hot-blooded young artist, Pulki Maladoy Hudoznik, was so taken with the model's beauty that he was simply inspired to create. In other words, artists painted these for themselves. Now, it's certainly possible that the artist was inspired by the model's beauty, but I don't think this fully explains his painting repetitions, nor does it explain another artist copying it. As a mature artist, Tiranov became an outstanding portraitist. Bilinsky put him absolutely on a par with Brulov, 
writing, and this is a, a loose paraphrase, that an ordinary painter could paint your likeness or something very much like you, but Brulov or Tiranov would create a work of art, capturing not only your likeness, but your very soul. Here we see Tiranov as a society portraitist, painting the wife of a distinguished architect on the right, and on the left, another elegantly dressed woman. When we see these two together, it becomes clear that Tiranov has developed a formula for female beauty. Uh, a round face, smooth, shining dark hair, sloping round shoulders. In both pictures, he lights the figure from the left so that her shoulder is highlighted against the dark background, casting part of her face in shadow. Any woman wanting her portrait done would want to look like this. It becomes Tiranov's signature look. And other artists, of course, had their own signature formula. Today, we might call it a brand. This formula also leads to certain efficiency in production, even for portraits. But still looking at these, we should remember a key difference between the two. A portrait is a unique work, almost always made on commission. It's not just a likeness, um, not just capturing the soul, uh, as Bilinski said, um, but often presents the sitter with distinctive emblems, a piece of jewelry, their own clothing, sometimes in a setting that's specific to the individual. So for all of these reasons, portraits take longer to make, uh, though they do bring in more money. Golovki are made for the market. They're not just formulaic, but they're often repetitions or variations on the theme in a simple format, relatively easy and fast to produce, all of which made them relatively inexpensive. In short, a Golovka is in its very essence a market commodity whose existence goes hand in hand with the expansion of the art market. We know that in the 19th century Netherlands, based on Dutch sales records, the Troni was consistently the very least expensive of paintings. I need to verify if the same was true in Russia, but I suspect that it was. When we add this slightly more covered up, a Golovka that Tiranov made about 10 years later using a slightly different formula, of course, he continues to develop as an artist. Um, seeing these together, we, we, we can uh, tell that society portraits, Golovki, eroticizing Golovki, and nudes exist on a continuum of marketable images of women. The skills for making one, were transferable to making the others, so that artists like Tiranov can be seen as specialists in images of female beauty. These different incarnations of loveliness could be acquired at different prices for different purposes and, and different tastes for propriety or sensuality. I should note also that Tiranov did not make any full-length nudes, at least not that I know of, although some of his contemporaries did make, pa make paintings of this whole range, this whole spectrum of things. Uh, Timofey Neff at the elite end of the market and artists like Nikolai Maikov at the lower end of the market. Um, another note is that some of Tirano's portraits depicted men. Um, I'd be happy to show you those. I, I have a, a number of images of different things that I could share after the talk during the Q&A. Um, he made images of his fellow artists as well as distinguished uh, members of society. Um, but the images of the depictions of female beauty obviously exist on this continuum from the por society portrait to the Golovka to the nude. Now, opinions, opinions about the proliferation of these female images at Russian exhibitions varied. In 1851, a writer for Atyachesvinya Zapisky asserted, the depiction of female beauty is one of the most difficult and most exalted tasks of art. And he was in fact writing specifically about uh, Nikolai Maikov, whom I just mentioned. This uh, same writer reproached young artists for studying too little the beauty and grace of forms in the figures they depict. So for him, these kinds of images were uh, a good thing in, in the art world. But for other high-minded observers, the increasing numbers of Golovki and society portraits became a cause for concern. For example, the painter Alexander Ivanov blamed the academy for turning artists into entrepreneurs by giving them high hopes for a glorious career, but an education that was insufficient to make that happen. After an artist finished his training, Ivanov wrote, this dumb soul then grasps at everything, and soon our brother, the Russian artist, turns into a perfect merchant and a shameless speculator. This conflict entered literary fiction of the 1830s through 1850s with the advent of a new type of protagonist, the painter who faces the choice of being a great but impoverished artist or a successful sellout. And this is a selection of titles 
um, that exemplify the theme. To look at them very briefly, uh, Polyvoy's uh, Jiva Pisitz um, is about an icon painter who chooses poverty, and he's absolutely the exception on this list. None of the others want to choose poverty, not to choose it. Um, Timofeyev, I confess I haven't had the chance to read yet, but I believe that it uh, conforms to this general outline. Uh, Gogol's portrait is probably the best known to us. It's a supernatural story that I'll mention briefly later. Adoyevsky's story is part of his series, The Notes of an Undertaker, and the undertaker comes to um, find this, uh, this poor deceased artist. Uh, Shevchenko, uh, the first part of his story is semi-autobiographical, but then it basically becomes a different version of the Adoyevsky story in which the hero abandons his ideals of greatness to paint for money that he needs to support his mistress, model, muse, or wife. So I'll not attempt a literary analysis of Gogol's story. Um, I suspect that's been done before, um, but I will bring up a few moments that resonate with my theme for today. So the portrait, uh, which he wrote in the 1830s and then revised in eight, uh, pub, to publish in 1842, um, is a supernatural tale in which the hero is an artist who becomes possessed by a portrait that he buys, which brings him phenomenal success as a society portraitist. Uh, before this fateful event uh, in which he buys the painting, um, the, his teacher warns him, be careful, society is beginning to attract you. You can start painting fashionable little pictures and portraits for money, but in, an, in that event, talent is destroyed, not developed. Be patient, devote yourself to every single work. Let others make money, your time will surely come. The magical portrait that the hero buys seals his fate, but even before his career takes off under its spell, he's already been tempted to take the easy path. When we look around his studio, which happens towards the beginning of the story, among his projects are a head of psyche. I'm not saying it's this head of psyche, but just to give us something to look at, um, a head of psyche that strikes me as a Golovka, although he described it as being the most important work that he's, uh, that he's working on at the moment. <clears throat> so he has this head of psyche and a painting of a nude woman, among other things. Soon the portrait's magic transforms him into a fashionable and wealthy artist. And then in, when this is happening, the narrator describes him increasingly using shortcuts and formulas, just exactly what I just described, to execute the huge quantity of portrait commissions that nearly overwhelm him. The artist's colleague, whose work he sees at an exhibition, had chosen the other path, the path recommended by this um, old teacher. The, the colleague had, quote, endured poverty, humiliation, even hunger, but with rare self-sacrifice had remained, regardless of everything, insensible to all but his cherished art, end quote. Gogol evokes the portrait that this colleague exhibits with terms such as modesty, innocence, godlike faces, hymns of praise. So without actually describing the painting, he suggests a multi-figure religious subject, such as Ivanov's appearance of Christ to the people a detail of which we see here. So this kind of painting that, uh, that the colleague uh, made is absolutely the opposite to the simple formulaic marketable Golovki and portraits that so many artists were tempted to make. Stories like Gorgel's and the others I mentioned reflected, first of all, an awareness of the artist as a new character type that they could use to populate their fiction. That is an awareness of the art world as a distinct new milieu to explore. But more, interesting, more interestingly, to, to our point today, it demonstrates a real life concern over artists losing their way, seduced by women or money to take the easy path to fame and fortune by painting society portraits and pictures of pretty girls. It's easy to think about artists' choices in this way if you mainly encounter the art world at exhibitions, but most artists came from more humble backgrounds. They were um, from serfs, uh, townspeople and soldiers' families. The economic reality of their lives forced many of them to produce work for the market, even if they still strove for high artistic ideals. Examples of artists living the high life in mid 19th century Russia are vanishingly rare. They are much more common in fiction than they were on Vasilyevsky Island. In principle, there should have been no shortage of commissions for large scale history paintings at this time, given the intensive building of palaces and churches under Nicholas I. Yet most commissions for, uh, for St. Isaac's Cathedral and the many smaller churches built at this time went to academy professors and artists who were farther along in their careers, 
or at least better connected than many young artists at, of the period. At the same time, members of the middling classes were now starting to buy art, while opportunities to exhibit and sell to them appeared at the Society for the Encouragement of Artists and the picture shops that sprang up on Petersburg's Nevsky Prospect and Moscow's Kuznetsky Most. So the two case studies we've examined today allow us to consider how paintings navigated the challenges of making it as an artist by catering to this new audience by establishing a niche market with one type of painting, or by becoming a specialist in depictions of female beauty across a range of overlapping genres. The drive to establish an artistic identity in a competitive environment should be seen as part of a market phenomenon. The kinds of works we've examined today are usually considered beneath contempt, not only scorned by highbrow writers of the 19th century, but also marginalized in the scholarship today. As art historians, we should remember that major works of art and middling art existed side by side, shown at the same exhibitions, seen by the same viewers and patrons, and sometimes even produced by the same artists. By engaging with these works seriously and considering them within new interpretive frameworks, we can get a better sense of the 19th century Russian art world as a whole. Thank you. So thank you very much. And I think we'll open the floor to, to questions for Margaret and Sasha Spernik is going to moderate the Q&A. Thank you, Margaret, for a great talk. <clears throat> I have one thing to add and another question. Another literary work which you might look into is Garshin's story, Civil Art to artists. It's sort of typical of the 1860s political social philosophy and all that. But another question, a question I have is what about nudes of peasant women? All you showed us is really upper class ladies or classical figures. Mm -hmm. And what about peasants um, or mm -hmm. banya pictures, for example? Right. Okay, so yeah, that's a good question. So two, yeah, so uh, Garshin's, I'm familiar with Garshin's work, um, Nadezhda Nikolaevna, um, and I actually use that in the later part of my book manuscript. Um, today I was focusing on an earlier period and I was kind of trying to cut off about 1860, so that's the only reason I didn't include it. And there's also another um, work by Nikolai Leskov uh, called um, Astravitsyanye, about people who lived on Vasilyevsky Island. So those are, um, there are other ones I didn't mention, but I was just interested in this, these, these few decades of literary work where there seems to be this obsession with the artist making these choices of, you know, either following the noble path and starving and maybe, you know, dying or else being, being tempted by making pictures quickly. Um, um, uh, images of peasants bathing, yes. Um, so today I was really trying to focus on the Galovka more than uh, bathers and nudes, although that was sort of, there were some nudity including, included as a sub, uh, uh, kind of a, the loosened genre category of the, um, of the Galovka, uh, but there certainly are peasant bathers, um, most notably in Venetianov's work. Uh, and um, it's not, uh, well, it, and sort of, I, I would say, timeless bathers um, in later works of later 19th century Russian artists. So they're not marked as peasant or upper class necessarily. Um, um, Banya images um, exist more in the late 19th century, but they're not as common. Thank you. Okay, but thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Thank you, this was a, a great one. I agree with Anne that all the art history ones, of course, are, I think, phenomenal. But um, but this one was, I'm just so glad that I was able to tune in today with CAA coming later this week. It feels like a lot. But um, my question is maybe a, a silly one, especially for someone who also works on this material. But how did you find these variants and copies? I, you know, as someone who's worked on Brulov's uh, unusual variants, I know I came across them in, in kind of the, the most unusual way, just in terms of being like, wait a minute, is that is there a difference between these two? And then digging in from there. Um, so how did you find them? And then also, how did you get images from some of these smaller museums in, in Minsk and, and other places? I'm, I'm in awe of the work you've done just in terms of how you put this PowerPoint together. I personally would love to see the images of men that you said you have in the PowerPoint, if you don't mind sharing again, but-, but Oh, I'd be happy to, right. 
Okay, sure. Oh, how did I find the images? Well, um, part of it is the the kind of the until recently I leafing through catalogs. Leaf I just spend a lot of time leafing through catalogs, literally leafing through catalogs. Um, but uh, more recently, the Goss catalog um, that's online, uh, gosscatalog.ru. It's I find the search the search function a little bit clunky. Um, but if you haven't tried it yet, many happy hours of searching. So if you look up um, Italian morning, you find the variants. If you look up Ruloff, and how did I get the images? They're screenshots. They're not very good. But because we're all on screen here, they're not, they don't look as bad on your screen as they would if we were. I mean, we wish we were in person, but thank goodness <laughs> that we can all be together now, right? There are pros and cons. So they don't, they're actually really terrible images for the most part. Um, so I didn't, I wish I, you know, I, I, if, if, Yes, thank you, Lee I see you put it in the chat. Um, it's a great source um, that uh, that you should all use. Um, it's uh, you can find just yeah uh, copies and, and and things keep they keep putting the it's basically a database for the Russian state owned museums. Um, so if it's a city museum, it might not well. Anyhow, some museums aren't there, not every single museum in Russia, but the ones that are um, have a federal affiliation, I guess, are you know regional museums, some city museums. Um, uh, and they have not just works of, you know, painting and sculpture and so on, but they have, you know, um, uh, ruble notes and letters and vexel and, you know, like stuff that, you know, interesting things, archaeological objects, numismatics, you know, all kinds of stuff. So it's a really fun source. So, oh, you wanted to, uh, you wanted to see pictures of the, the images yeah, if there, of men. If there's time, and thank you for that lead, and thank you, Ludmila, as well, for the, the link. Sure. Hi, Margaret. Thank you so much for this really fascinating uh, talk. And I have, uh, I think, two kinds of questions and thoughts about it. Mm -hmm. So one of them was what struck me a lot about the Golovki or Golovki mm -hmm. is the fact that the emphasis is not on the clothing. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, there is an emphasis on jewelry, curiously enough. And because okay. there's, you know, in the one there's two double rings and the other one there's two rings on different fingers. And then there's the oddly placed uh, necklace on the Italian woman. So it's over her, her breast, which is unusual uh, since she's not moving in the in the, So I, I wondered if that's an in, intentional in the sense that if this, if these uh, paintings are addressed to a an up and coming middle class market whom and the women still don't have the kind of money they would like to have to dress more elaborately. So these paintings do that intentionally. So that's just a question and one from, I don't know if that would be the case, but it, it was sort of striking to me mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. it is, the emphasis really is on the body, mm -hmm. on, as unclothed as they choose to make it. Mm -hmm. But I wonder too, if you could or have thought about what these uh, heads can tell us more explicitly about Russian notions of female beauty and what they might contribute to an understanding of gender roles or gender uh, definitions in the mid 19th century. What Do you have any thoughts about what that might add to what we think we know about um, women in this period of time and people's perceptions of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those are both good questions. Um, <laughs> yes. So I think that um, I, I also have to say that your work on the fashion industry has also been formative in my thinking about Russia, the Russian art market. So I have to thank you for your own work um, in, in helping me to maybe not directly put this talk together, but for helping me to think about mid 19th century Russia and you know, the market for semi-luxury goods, you know, fashion and as well as paintings and thinking about the way people present themselves. So. Um, Emphasizing jewelry more than clothing. I perhaps that's the painters that I chose. Um, you know, there, these two are these two are just case studies. Other painters might have emphasized different things. And certainly, when we look at um, uh, well, 
Trapinin and others who, well, for, who painted, say, Ukrainian types or slightly more ethnic types, you know, they would emphasize regional dress more. So they'd be considered an, an ethnic type, but it's also a Galovka. It's an overlapping, like I said, overlapping category. So the um, category, uh, sorry, the, the issue of jewelry versus clothing, I think might just be the individual artist that I chose. Um, mm -hmm. Also, later on in the century, you get more and more of the Ruskia Krasavitsi, right? The Russian beauties who, um, who, are, who are there. What can the heads tell us about Russian notions of female beauty and gender roles? Um, that's a good question. Um, I will have to think about that. Um, I think that we, that when I think of some of them, um, especially the Tiranov uh, paintings, I look at, I think about Gogol's descriptions with the, the dark hair, the arched eyebrows and so on. Is that what you had in mind? The sort of typical no, I, I had in mind ideals some, of beauty? I, I think I'm, what I'm trying to suggest is, is that you have a source here mm -hmm. that can tell us more about Russian Russian uh, femininity, if you will. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I would just hope that you would, you know, think about this. What they, so what they tell us about um, ideals of femininity and female behavior, you mean, mm -hmm. in some cases? Yeah, I guess. Um, just however you, you think it might contribute, I guess, is what I'd mm -hmm. like to hear from you. Okay. Um, I think I will, yeah, that is something that I'll keep working on. That's a very good point because I wasn't considered, I was really thinking about the painters and the production of the paintings, but I wasn't thinking about the subject position of the women being depicted or the women perceiving them. Okay, thanks. So, so, so I mean, as far as say the widow is, you know, displaying an ideal of, of female um, um, a virtue, more so than the bathers perhaps, but the, the, mm -hmm. the you know, how one responds to the loss of the husband and, and so on. I think that's something that, especially with the repetition of the widows and the ideas picked up by different artists, um, certainly the case. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, Margaret, thank you so yeah. much for this fascinating and thought provoking talk. And I, I was wondering about, um, uh, I think uh, a point which is, also relevant to the issue of the art market, which uh, you are focusing on uh, in regard to these uh, pictures. So I, I wonder about the um, uh, exposition of this kind of uh, Galovki and the way how they were displayed, uh, whether in the interiors of the uh, aristocrat or nouveau riche and so on and so forth. So you partly address this issue in your article, Making a Case for Realism, mm -hmm. uh, I guess. Uh, and um, I wonder whether there is a difference in this earlier period. So uh, can we talk about uh, certain types of norms uh, of displaying such kind of uh, pictures, especially if we talk about nudes or semi-nudes and uh, what what does this tell us about the those uh merchants those collectors who chose to not only to purchase them but also to uh explicitly hang a piece in his study or whenever thank you so much uh -huh. yes so thank you that's a good question um i would um, I'd like to find out more about how these were displayed uh, because that's some the, the only kinds of records that we have. Let me see if I can bring this up successfully. Um, we have things like this. Obviously, this is not a document. This is a, a painting um, that shows a you know perhaps prototypical uh, upper middle class house um, where we see the Fyodor Muller's bride. We see another painting by Tiranov, The Girl with a Tambourine, which I, I, I have not been able to find a, a good copy of. Um, this might be a Golovka. Um, it doesn't look like a portrait. It strikes me as a Golovka. So I, this is the, what I, you know, the, the, the kind of information that I have on how they might be displayed. 
Um, but you have you. This is a painting you've seen before, and you probably that doesn't surprise you at all. <laughs> um, as far as where they were displayed, um, where they would display a, a nude specifically, um, um, we don't have a lot of information. I have fragmentary records like from the 18th century or, or early 19th century that one paint, you know, somebody might, somebody would keep that in their cabinet as opposed to in their main room, but then other people, um, well, you know, the Yusupovs, of course, the Yusupovs are a unique collection, right? They had a whole, you know, salon of, of Cupid and Psyche where that was where they hung their nudes. So um, it, it, it really varied uh, depending on the collector, but I'm afraid I don't have information to be able to make a generalization about. I'm still looking. So uh, uh, Allison is wondering about drawings uh, and also mm -hmm. the relationship to miniature paintings. Any thoughts on that, Margaret? Drawings. Um, what about drawings? Um, so, well, there were drawings. Um, there were drawings in of Golovki. There were, uh, you know, the drawings were less expensive. They were faster to produce than paintings, um, and so they were certainly um, they were certainly part of the art market. Um, if you look at, for example, the things that were on view and things that were a part of the the annual raffles of the Society for the Encouragement of Artists. Um, they regularly had drawings and sometimes they were drawn copies after other um, other artists. And so um, as far as in the inventories that I've looked at and the Goss catalog, I haven't found drawings after these. I found some prints after the works that I that I've been looking at, um, but I haven't found drawn, you know, drawn multiples, that is to say. Um, Golo Golovki as Miniatures. Miniatures tend to be portraits. Miniatures tend to be portraits. So if, if there's something that I'm not getting with your question, please don't hesitate to, um, to interject. Um, Shuzat Mirza asks, um, in case some of these work, works have been sold recently, what is their valuation now to have a trajectory of how artworks produced for market are now seen as perhaps more seminal? Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. I, I actually, that's a, I, I don't follow the art market now. I should. Yes. Um, I, I should see how much these kinds of things are on auction because they do go, they do go on, on sale um, or they have gone on sale. I haven't, I actually don't know, I'm afraid. And a question from Lee Singh uh, to expand on Christine Rand's second question. Mm. How can you connect the individual artists' concepts of beauty to broader conceptions of female beauty and gender roles in different strata of 19th century Russian society? Like peasant beauty versus uh, middling class of beauty. Yeah, so my observation is that with a, I, I, I hope that I'm getting at your, the answer to your question, what you're asking, um, that the peasants, uh, images of peasant women tended to be more individualized and more, specific, more um, sometimes not as um, smoothed out and uh, conventionally beautified as the, Kind of elegant um, Golovki um, that we saw um, often. So, like the Venetianov peasant women and even Tiranov's early peasant women, uh, they tend to be um, sometimes older women as well as um, young girls. Um, they tend to sometimes have irregular features. Um, there's and um, the peasant also in, of the lower classes, interestingly they'll often also depict men and boys, um, old men, not usually middle-aged men, usually middle-aged men and middle-aged women are not of interest. Um, it's usually um, young girls are, are um, devushki or young boys or old men with, you know, very interesting character faces filled with character, but the um, boys and men tended to be uh, peasants. Um, uh, women, uh, you don't see in the more um, elegant uh, Galovki that we look at, we don't really see um, anyone but the Djavushki, the young women. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I think the reason I mentioned miniatures is mm. um, I know that you've been interested in them in the past, very distant past. And I thought that maybe some of the same aesthetic preferences leaked over, um, even though the miniatures, of course, would be made for particular people, mm -hmm. some of the same style 
visually, it seems to me, creeps in there, but you mm -hmm. would know more than I do about that. Oh, definitely. Yeah, they would be uh, portraits. Um, yeah, in, in definitely the portrait style. Um, they would be the same kind of elegant portrait and and certainly being able to achieve some kind of detail of lace or jewelry or something that was individual um, would be all the more challenging because it was done on such a fine scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then usually they're done in a, a, an oval or tondo format too, which yes. was also enhances that sense of intimacy. Right, sort of neoclassical international. Yes. Yeah, very, mm -hmm. yes. thanks. Thank you. Um, and a question from uh, Karen Kettering. Mm. Uh, how did the Golovki intersect with the portrait miniature in terms of market notions of beauty class? That's a good question. Um, I actually haven't investigated portrait miniatures as, as much as I should apparently. Um, um, I'm finding these questions are, are bringing up all sorts of great avenues for me to connect this into. So I'll have to sort of put some of them aside to investigate later when I decide to pr pursue Golovki more fully. Um, but um, they, um, a portrait miniature, well, they're not, I mean, they're either made for a small thing that you can put on the table. Well, you know this, Karen, but I'm just uh, saying this for anybody else, but they might be small enough that you could wear for jewelry. Um, and of course, this would be a semi-luxury object that you could, um, that you could uh, adorn yourself with. So this was definitely part of the, uh, the kind of thing that a middle class or upper middle class person would wear. And it does certainly have an overlap with between the fine arts and decorative arts. Um, um, I don't know if I could say anything more, more, more coherent than that. I would say the market would be really the same or overlapping. All right. And we have a question from Alice Christ. Do you see a change in the status of religious decoration versus icon painting versus history painting and markets? versus patronage as factors in identity as great artists by the later 19th century? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it depends on who's, who's asking and who's being asked. Um, it's, 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 you know, being asked to paint a history painting or being asked to paint a, 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 a church painting is, is um, retains its status, I would say, until um, the painting of St. Isaac's or the painting of, um, um, the Cathedral of Christ the Savior. After that, we don't see a lot more um, major church decorations happening at the same time as we see the, you know, sort of concurrent things. You have a sort of the, the burst of building churches ends at the same time as the rise of genre painting um, really blossoms with the advent of realism in the period Vizhniki. So um, after the 18... 50s and then of course the 60s the um, cathedral of christ the savior in moscow is being painted um, um all of that happens at the same time so the the as far as the relative status um i wouldn't say that the status of history painting um is is lower it's just that it, the peop, the the way the historiography has it the scholarship has paid a lot more attention to the realist paintings and the things that are not um, his, history painting, the things that are not religious painting. Um, but there was certainly, um, there were certainly history painters and religious painters who were working into the later 19th century. Okay. Well, I have too many questions. So some of them are reserved for later for Margaret, but this is a, a kind of speculative or the theoretical or outsider's question. And that is, that I'm always fascinated between this sort of problematic relationship between reproduction, you know, the idea of repetition and quality, mm -hmm. right? If you have a lot of something, is it necessarily worth less? And I, I thought about that. I actually um, worked on Gogol's story, Patriot, which I think is partly a meditation on that and this problematic relationship between repetition and quality and can you have both? Um, and then what's always confused me, and this is my outsider, not historian um, question, is then what about icons? Aren't they about repetition? Um, and how are they, but, but obviously they're magically exempt from, um, 
from this phenomenon that you see elsewhere, which is if you have a lot of something, even if it's made by hand, if there are a lot of them, they're devalued. So I don't know if that's even a question, but it's just something that really fascinates me as soon as you start talking about markets and quantity, there's this intense anxiety about quality. And it, I'm sure that it's a post-romantic or a romantic slash post-romantic preoccupation. I don't think that, you know, the 18th century would have had precisely the same anxiety because I don't think they located the worth of artworks in singularity. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's a question, but it's a speculation. Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, so I, yeah, actually your question, um, I just saw Alice's uh, addition to her question in the chat. Um, it was to whether the Golovkin market overlaps with the Icon market and also this issue of repetition um, in Icons and Golovkin. So um, in the 19th century art world, interestingly, a lot of the painters started to be the same painters. In other words, academy trained artists who were painting, who were trained in history, painting and portraiture were also painting icons. Um, and um, I haven't, I haven't worked on icons in the 19th century, so I can't say that I'm an expert, but I do know that those, they are two very different types of painting. Um, so even though they bring their academic skills in rendering the human figure, um, the purpose of the icon is it's an object of veneration. And um, the fact that it, it, it does repeat is, um, um, the fact that it, it is repeated after a pattern, in fact, uh, does, um, it, it's actually part of its value. Um, so it's, it's part of its importance. And yet some icons are better than others. Some icons are more significant, you know, more considered to be more visually, um, of more visual interest. Um, I, I don't want to use the word beautiful, but maybe beautiful is an okay word, but they're not aesthetic objects, even though they can be admired aesthetically. They're, the concern is whether they're icon, whether they're, they're, they're miracle working. Um, and I, one time I was in um, a museum when they had a, the whole room was blocked off and there was specially um, having a, a visit from people from a small town in this Moscow museum um, where they were visiting the icon that had been taken from their town. It was a miracle working of Saint, miracle working icon of St. Nicholas. Um, and um, this, one of the, um, of Smatritelnitsi took me into the room because she knew I was an American visitor and she wanted me to see this event of these people visiting this icon. So the icon was behind plexiglass and they were touching the plexiglass, kissing the plexiglass and um, venerating the icon behind the plexi. And there was an icon right behind them that had been painted as a copy of this icon that was not covered by plexi that was of no interest. Right, because this icon behind the plexi was of their was their icon, and it was she. And as the the woman explained to me, you know, this is a miracle working icon. Of course, they're both yeah. miracle working icons, but this one especially so. Thank so, you. in other words, it has this intangible um, quality that the copy, the fact that it's a copy, doesn't matter. That it's just a different kind of issue of copying with icons than it is with works of art. Right, with works of art, it's a market phenomenon. It has nothing to do with miracles. Um, it. Thank you. Fascinating. Great. Oh, and we have a question from Louise Herdeman. Um, mm -hmm. Could you comment a little more on what the market is at this time in terms of sales channels um, uh, in direct commission, exhibition, dealer, etc.? To compare with, say, Britain, presumably there are no private galleries selling art. And a second question, do prints play any role at this time in catalyzing the art market for this type of work, or is it kind of below the mainstream work, as you mentioned? Right. Okay, great questions, Louise. This is the kind of thing that, that I've been um, really thinking about. So it's sales channels. Um, there is the, the main channel that we have outside of the regular academy exhibitions, which is not, you know, things, people see things there, but it's not a sales market, right? Um, the main place that, are, that outlet for artists work is at the um, Society for the Encouragement of Artists on Nevsky, which is in the Dutch church building, um, which is now well, it's still there, <laughs> it's still there, right? the Dutch church building. Um, and there were in that same building, not only the, that the society, which had its permanent exhibition um, established, I don't remember the date, but I wanna say 1830. Um, 
it could have been earlier though, um, was there were a couple of print shops also like Felton and a couple of other print dealers. Sometimes those print dealers also would sell paintings occasionally. Um, so uh, there were picture shops along Nevsky, um, like um, um, Daciaro and others also on Kuznetsky most. There were two uh, branches of it in Moscow and in St. Petersburg. So there were a couple of, uh, of picture shops or mostly print dealers that also would help facilitate communications between uh, artists and patrons. So a number of the, in my understanding, um, what and from what I read in, in primary sources, namely artists, artist journals and you know letters, correspondence, um, is that a lot of them are dealing with art. Um, you know, they have a client come to their studio. And so it's not it's something that never goes on exhibition. And that's another thing that's interesting about portraiture is a lot of the sale is private. So sometimes the portrait of the beautiful woman, right, the wife of the architect or whoever it is, might never be seen publicly. It might be something that just is painted in the artist's studio and then uh, goes on view in the home. And maybe they're only, only their small circle of, of friends can see it. Whereas the Golovka would be made for the market so that it would go to the uh, Society for the Encouragement of Artists or it might go to one of these picture shops where people could see it. It was kind of a, kind of a calling card. Um, so commissions, dealers, um, exhibitions. I've kind of been surprised at how, how, I wouldn't say how many because we don't know exactly what they're showing, but there are a number of picture shops and um, there's another mention of a dealer um, that's south of Nevsky that I, I see mentioned in the literature as well. Um, so private galleries, not in the modern sense, but picture shops and love key, the, um, the kind of thing that, uh, that Gogol's hero in the portrait visits at the beginning of it, right? So that's selling, um, it's selling foreign works, it's selling things that are sort of mass produced in the provinces. Um, but if you were a painter and you had a picture to sell, you could also take your work to a lovka and sell it. You know, it wouldn't be to have any prestige, but that would be a, a possible option. Um, you want to ask about prints catalyzing the art market for this type of work. Absolutely. So the best, um, the, uh, the most popular works at the exhibitions, the ones who were, that were getting a lot of attention would be made into prints. Um, and um, there, are, there are lots of examples um, of this happening. Um, I think I'm going to actually see if I can share my screen again. And I just... Okay, yes, I can do this. So if I go to the slide right before this, um, this is why I couldn't show this slide because the only picture of it I could find had this watermark, but this is the picture that made Tiranov's reputation in 1836. So he'd been, he just started studying with Gruloff and he painted this and I'm not even sure the one on the left is his or if it's a copy and it's not a good, whatever. Anyhow, it, it really made his reputation. It, um, it, the girl with the tambourine, you can see that he has this lighting effect. This is his, his effects that people talk about in, in the reviews or criticize, um, that he brings the light from the left shining onto her face through the tambourine. And she has these, he has these great effects on her hand. Her, she's looking right out at us. She looks like she's moving from the right to the left side of the canvas because her gauzy um, you know, white scarf is trailing behind her. And this was made into a print within four years. And even in um, either Adoyevsky or Shevchenko, I think it's Shevchenko's uh, story, um, they compare the hero's painting. Oh, it was so popular. People were crowding around it with their jaws dropped open. It was just like Tiranov's girl with a tambourine. And that was written in the, you know, wow. decades later. So this painting made a, a huge impact and it, um, it was reproduced in prints um, and, and distributed widely. And this is, this is the first print that I know that was made of it, but not the only one. It, there were a lot of prints made. So they were absolutely um, instrumental in popularizing, publicizing, and also um, you know, disseminating images. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes, and artists could be employed coloring prints. That's true, yes. I would just like to, if we don't have any more questions, I wanna thank Professor Charmel again, Margaret, and say again how excited I am to see a 19th century visual culture represented at the Jordan Center and in 19V, and please bring us more. It's, it's been absolutely fascinating to hear 
from you and um, we look forward to when the sound stop on March 4th. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Yes. So thank you for pointing out Dimitri Semaryukin's work. Yes, I'm familiar with his work. He deals a lot with uh, art exhibiting uh, and art uh, places to exhibit art. So that's a good a good place to read if you're looking in interested in art dealers. Yes. Great. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. We'll see you all soon.